All right, I've been thinking about this story uh, just the last week, so I thought I'd just preach some thoughts on the, the story of the alabaster box. If you guys don't know the story of the alabaster box, it's where the lady came and she broke open a box of alabaster, an alabaster box of precious ointment and anointed Jesus. Uh, you might only think that there is one occurrence of this and that it's just, uh, you know, multiple times it's alluded to the same story in the different Gospels, but there are actually, there are actually two different women Right? Two different women, both having an alabaster box, both in a house of somebody called Simon and anointing the feet of Jesus. And, and we'll look at those two passages and I'll show you that they are actually two different occurrences. And, and you might not know this. And this is the interesting thing when you actually start studying the New Testament. You study the Gospels and you see the stories side by side. You realize, hey, these are actually the same event. These, these are actually different events, different people. But people get confused uh, on who the ladies are because, um, you know, they're just assuming that it is the same person. So I'm preaching on the alabaster box. We'll, we'll look at the different parables. We'll look at the difference. And then um, uh, we'll talk about a few applications in our own life and what this alabaster box can represent. So what is, if you don't know what an alabaster box is, uh, I didn't either. You know, I just looked up on Google, like, what's an alabaster? alabaster? Alabaster is a type of stone, supposed to be like marble. Like they make, the, you know, the temple was made out of certain alabaster elements as well. So it's, it's supposedly, it's like this little white box that's made of marble and it's sealed with wax. And then that's why, you know, it says she broke open the alabaster box. It would be sealed with the precious ointment inside and then they'd break open the wax and then, and then you could smell the ointment as it was coming out. I don't know if the ointment was in a bottle within the box or whether it just sat floating in that box. I'm not too sure, but it was a, it was a box of marble or stone that held this ointment. Now in Luke 7, uh, verse 36, we see this first occurrence of this unknown lady that comes to this house where Jesus is eating at this Pharisee's house and she's obviously weeping and wiping uh, his feet and, and breaks open this box. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. So this is Jesus. He's gone to eat at this Pharisee's house who's invited him over to eat. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner... Now, we don't know what her sin was. I mean, we assume that she was a fornicator. Maybe she was, in, she was an adulterer or a fornicator. Maybe she was a prostitute, right? Which is why the Pharisee is saying, like, well, you know, if you knew what she's like, you wouldn't want her touching him, right? Because obviously fornication is unclean, right? And if you're a prostitute and you're fornicating for a living, you know, you might not be the cleanest person out there, especially at this time uh, uh, in, in, in the age what I find random, though, is, you know, when I read this story, it's like, you know, if, if you invite somebody over for dinner, how come there's just, like, random people who are just, like, walking into the house and doing things? So I don't know what the culture is like back then. You know, maybe, you know, when they have people over for dinner. I know, like, maybe it's like in Mexico. You know, in Mexico, when they have a party, they have people over for dinner, like, the people that are in the community, they kind of come and go in the house as well. It's just because everyone knows each other. So it might have been like that, like a very close-knit community. And, you know, even though it was a private dinner, this this lady in the city that everyone knew just comes in to see Jesus in this person's house, in this Pharisee's house. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. So we don't really know if this, this lady was poor, because obviously she had this alabaster box of ointment, which was, which was very expensive. And we see later on, when we see Mary of Bethany's alabaster box, Judas commenting that it was, could have been sold for 300 pence, you know, and given to the poor. And you remember when we read in Matthew how they, the, the workers in the vineyard, they worked for a day and they earned a penny. So you can see it's not, it's not talking about one cent like in America when, when, when the Bible talks about a penny or 300 pence. The penny or the pence in the Bible represents one day's labor, you know. So when you think about 300 pence, this ointment is very, very expensive. 300 days of work to, to buy this alabaster box of oil. Or if you had it, you could sell it for 300 days of labor. And, and stood at his feet um, behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. So again, I think for us culturally, we look at something like this and think that it's a little bit odd that somebody would want to anoint somebody's feet and kiss them, wipe them with the hairs of her head. But, you know, maybe they had different customs uh, back then and different practices which they find 
acceptable. It's like today, you know, when the Bible says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. And for me, it's like, it's a bit hard culturally to get past that. I'm not really the, the kissing type. But, you know, you see like a, some Arabic cultures and Lebanese cultures, you know, they see each other and they kiss each other on the face. I, I think it's like that, you know, like I, I look at that in the, and maybe it's like here, you know, what's the deal with the washing of the feet and the, and the wiping of the feet? Uh, uh, but it's something it, culturally that would, was normal and accepted back then. But, you know, for us now, it's just we've, we haven't done it. We haven't grown up with that. So he stood at his feet behind him weeping. I was a bit confused when I read and stood at his feet behind him weeping. But then I realized to stand at somebody's feet doesn't necessarily mean that you're right where their feet are. Because if you think he's sitting at the table, his feet are probably under the table. So how is she standing at his feet? But... I believe when you look at other times in the Bible where people stood at their feet, like you sat at somebody's feet, it's like you're right next to them. It's not, it doesn't mean that you are literally where their feet are. Like if you're standing behind them, you're still right next to them, even though his feet are that way and, and she's not, you know, the feet aren't facing her. Began to wash his feet with tears. So she's weeping and she's wiping her teeth, thinking about, you know, probably the things that she's done, that she's not even worthy to, to, to be saved of her sins, which, is, which happens with a lot of people. You know, they've done things in the past and they think, you know, what, why would God want anything to do with me? I'm not worthy of his grace uh, and things like that. So a lot of people can see their own reflection in this lady as they come to him and she, they've done terrible things in the past. And he'd wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, <clears throat> he spake within himself, saying... So you see how this Pharisee, he doesn't actually say this openly, right? He's at the table, you know, they're eating, this lady comes in to, with the ointment, starts wiping Jesus' feet and anointing his feet, and he, he doesn't actually say anything, but he, he's just thinking within himself, right? And just thinking in his mind. And, and that's interesting that Jesus knows what he's thinking, right? Because Jesus is God. He knows what he's thinking, even though he doesn't say this out loud. Um... He spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, so you see here he's even doubting, you know, what who Jesus actually is. So he's saying if he's even a prophet, not, not really believing that Jesus is God, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, so you can see here that the Pharisee's name was Simon, right? I have somewhat to say unto thee, and he saith, Master, say on. So now Jesus goes into this, uh, this parable um, in response to what he knows Simon the Pharisee is, is thinking in his mind as this lady comes to anoint Jesus' feet with this alabaster box of ointment and she's obviously broken over her past. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? So what is he saying here? He's saying here that there's a creditor, right? And he's got two people that owe him money. One owes 500 pence and the other 50, right? So one owes 10 times more than the other. But then the master basically says, the, cre the creditor says, well, you know what? You can both not pay me back. You know, don't have to pay back the debt. He forgave them both. And then Jesus asked the question, well, who's going to love that creditor more, right? If somebody owed 500 and somebody owed 50, which, which will love that credit or be, will be more grateful to that creditor? Um, and Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. So we can see here that it's not wrong to judge. To judge is to just sometimes to discern. You know, you can judge and condemn as well. Um, but Jesus is saying, Here, hey, you've rightly judged. You have discerned and, and judged rightly in terms of who will love the creditor more. Obviously the one that was forgiven more. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, had not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So this is the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach this Pharisee, to saying the reason why this lady loves me so much is because she has been forgiven of a lot, just like in that example of the creditor. And he's comparing her love 
to his love. And you can see here, as he sits at the table, he thinks he's better than this lady, right? It's like kind of like, well, you know, this lady, you don't even want to touch her, right? But then Jesus is saying, you know, he's not looking at the past, right? Where that's what the world looks at, right? The world might look at your past, things you've done in the past, maybe you've tarnished your reputation, like this lady has, right? In the city, everyone knows this lady is a sinner, right? She's got a terrible reputation. What she was doing in the past was obviously very questionable. Maybe she was a prostitute, maybe she was an adulterer, maybe she was a fornicator. But it's interesting when, when she comes to Jesus, you know, and she's... Um, broken over what she's done she comes for forgiveness jesus accepts her right and jesus isn't looking at her past whereas the pharisee is isn't he he's looking at he looks at the woman he looks at her past this is what the world does the world looks at your past they look at your reputation and they write you off whereas jesus with, with jesus there's grace right with jesus there's forgiveness with jesus there's a new day right where you can start over again he can use you even though you've done terrible things in the past and when this this pharisee is sitting here looking at this woman writing her off what does jesus do he sort of switches it right and he looks at what he she's doing now right yeah yeah she had this questionable past maybe she didn't do as what she did should have done in the past but jesus looks from now and says hey well what is she doing now right she she she's anointing my feet what did you do she's you know she's uh, you know not ceased to kiss my feet you didn't give me a kiss she you didn't give even give me any water to wash my feet when i came to your house and she's washed my feet with tears so i think what we can learn here is is that jesus doesn't look at your past if you confess your sins like you know she obviously is broken over this you know he, he's he's ready to move on if you're ready to move on and he can still use you the world may continue to dwell in your past so you ought not to be like the world right you ought not to dwell in your past you've done terrible things in the past hey you just confess that as a sin to god he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness and then we can move on and this is where jesus's focus is here it's like hey what are you, what is she doing now yeah you did terrible things in the past but what are you doing now when he compares what she's doing now to what this pharisee is doing now yeah, he doesn't have the dirty past, but he's actually doing less than what this woman is doing. And he points it back to, hey, what are you doing now? What are you going to do in the future? Wherefore I say unto the her sins are forgiven, uh, for she loved much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So we see here that our response to God, right, is based on how much we realize we've been forgiven. Because none of us really have a little bit of sins, right? I think, you know, how much we love God is really just our reflection of how much we realize we've actually been forgiven. So sometimes we love little because we're not grateful for what Jesus has done for us. Because if we realize what Jesus did for us, what he does for us, I'm sure we would respond in much more love than we are today. So he says here, if you're forgiven little, you love little, but when you realize you've been forgiven much, like this lady, she loved much because she realized how much she'd been forgiven. And, and obviously, you know, there are people that are more sinful than others, you know, so it's the people, and also for people practically as well, that have committed worse sins in the past. You know, they often, if they get saved, they realize the grace that God extends to them. They end up doing greater things for God because of the, the difference, right, in where they were and where they are now, as opposed to somebody that may have grown up in a Christian family. Um, but that's why also to whom much is given, much more shall be required, right? So somebody might have had a, a bad life, a bad upbringing, and if they're doing more than you are, then shame on you. You know, because we have been given more. We have been given a life of privilege, right? Where we are not living on the street. We don't worry about our, where our next meal comes from. And if we're doing less than the person that had nothing and they're doing more for God than us, then shame on us, right? If that's, if that's the case. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they sat at meat with him. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. So we can see the difference here. So what, what is the scenario here? Jesus is eating at a, at a Pharisee's house. Uh, his name is Simon. An unnamed woman comes in. She's a sinner in the city. And you can see that the scenario is she is weeping. She's broken over her past, what she's done. She's weeping, wiping his uh, feet with her hair. And you see that the, the conclusion of this after he 
tells the lesson of, you know, we love based on how much we've been forgiven, the conclusion here is the assurance of her salvation, right? He's saying, hey, go in peace, right? Thy sins, that thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Uh, I just want to see if I just uh, missed anything I wanted to share with you guys on this passage. Now, one thing you'll see here, if you see Jesus is reflecting on her love and what he's doing for her compared to what the Pharisee is doing for him at this point in time, we can see here that he measures the woman's love by the things that she does, right? So love is just not this emotion. It's not, it's not just this feeling that you get where it's, it's sort of like the Pentecostals are like that, where, you know, when they say they love God, they, you know, they go to church and the music's playing and everything's so emotional. And they're like, oh, man, I just love God so much. He's just so great. It's the greatest there is. And then they leave church and then nothing changes. Live the same life. Maybe they're living in fornication. They leave church, still living in fornication, still going out getting drunk, still being worldly. That's not love. Right? Love is just not this emotional response. You come to church, you just think about how great God is, and then you go home and do nothing different. No, love is when we actually do what He commands us, right? If we love Him, then we'll keep His commandments. That's what Jesus says. If you love me, keep my commandments. And we see this, uh, this theme throughout the Bible, that love is not just an emotion, it's not just devotion, but it, it is carried out in actions, right? You can't say that you love God, right, and, and not keep his commandments because the fact that you keep his commandments proves that you love God. You know, it's like people say to me, it's like, well, can you love God? Can't you just love God and not read the Bible? Can't you just love God and not go soul winning? Can't you just love God and not go to church? No, because if you loved God, you would go to church. If you loved God, you would read your Bible. If you loved God, you would want to preach the gospel because that's how you show you actually do love God. Because if you don't do those things, it shows that you don't actually love God even though you profess to love God. Right? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But see here, Galatians 5.14, for all the law, right? these are the works, is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So you see the law... All these commandments, it's all about love, right? Loving your neighbor as yourself, right? And obviously, we're not saved by the law. You know, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. I'm not saying... That's why, like, people say, right? Some people say, how can you be saved and not love God? Well, it's because I'm not saved by works, right? Because if I was saved by works, then I would have to love God in order to be saved. But if I'm not saved by works, therefore, I don't need to love God in order to be saved. I just have to receive the grace that God extends to me. You know, salvation is God, God loves me enough to give me grace. It's not I love God, because if I love God, I'll keep his commandments, right? And I don't keep the commandments to get saved. I just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But if in gratitude, if, if, if I have the right response to salvation, I will want to keep his commandments, right? Because I would want to love God because I realize how much God has done for me, how much God has forgiven me of. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And look at this, and that his commandments are not grievous, right? So, yes, is going to church and reading your Bible and praying and going soul winning better than doing nothing at all? Of course. But where do you want to strive? You want to get to the point where you actually want to do these things for God. It's not grievous. It's a pleasure to serve God. You're grateful that you have the opportunity to even do it, that you have been called as children of God to serve the living God. And this is what he's saying here. This is the love of God. It's not just that we do his commandments, but his commandments are not grievous. They're not a burden for you to do, right? Because if they're a burden for you to do, then... You know, you don't love him as much as you, as you think you do. I mean, think about when, you know, when you start, you know, when you're dating, you know, those of you who are single or those of you who are, um, early, you know, just married, you know. You, you know, when, when you love your spouse, I mean, nothing is too hard, right? You, you, you know, you live out in Penrith and they live, you know, in the eastern suburbs and you'll drive to go take them home. You know, you'll, you'll make sure, you'll, you'll fight the truck. You'll do whatever, right, for that person. This is how we ought to treat God, that we love him so much because this is how he treated us. You know, we love God because he first loved us. I mean, he came down from heaven, you know, and he, and he, and he died on the cross. He traveled further than, you know, east to west Sydney. Um, he came down from heaven to, to die for us. You know, what have we done for him? 2 John uh, 1, 6, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. 
Right? So our love is showed by our actions, isn't it? You know, if we love Jesus, we'll keep his commandments. Let's look at the other passage. Um, and this is Mary of Bethany, right? So this, the lady in Luke 7 was not Mary of Bethany. And you'll see here that when we look at Matthew 26, and, and Mary of Bethany's situation is in Matthew, Mark, and John, right? Luke 7 was the other lady. And you'll see the differences now, now that we've gone through it, and you're familiar with the other story. When we look at this one, you'll see that it's a completely different scenario. But the reason why people get confused is because the name of the person's house is Simon as well. And there's also an alabaster box of ointment, you know, in this story, right, where she, it, Jesus is anointed with. Matthew 26, 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, so remember, they're in Bethany now. If you, I, I sort of looked up where they were in Luke 7, and they were sort of up north, if you look on a map, where the Sea of Tiberias is, and he's going back and forth in Galilee. Um, so they're sort of like up there, if you look on a map, and then, you know, Bethany is down towards Jerusalem, you know, if you look at a map of Israel. So they're in different locations as well. So they're in Bethany here. They're near the Sea of Tiberias in Luke 7. In the house of Simon the leper. So this is not Simon the Pharisee. This is Simon the leper. You know, he might have been somebody that was healed by Jesus. You know, and they're having him over, uh, over for dinner. Um, but you can see here that Simon is a very common name. That's why even Mary is a common name. That's why when they, they say, oh, they found the tomb of Mary and Joseph and whatever, and they make up all these archaeological things, and one thing you just have to realize is that these names are very common. You know, how many Marys were there? There's Mary of Mag Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, and then there's, I think there's the other Mary. I don't know if that's Mary of Bethany. And then Mary's, Jesus' mother is Mary. But then you have Simon as well, you know, Simon Peter, Simon the leper, Simon the Pharisee, Simon the sorcerer. You know, there's all these Simons. Very common name. Um, there came unto him... So they're, they're eating at Simon the leper's house. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. So remember in the other scenario, he, she was anointing his feet with ointment. But here she's anointing from the top down on his head and he, as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation saying, to what purpose is this waste? Is it ever a waste to serve Jesus? Is it ever a waste to do something for Jesus? Of course not, right? So obviously these guys have the right, wrong frame of mind. She's doing something for the Lord. And, you know, they're being critical of her saying, why are you wasting this stuff? No, it's not a waste whenever you invest something, whether it's material or time, for serving Jesus. It's not a waste. For this, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. So a couple of things here is, you know, in verse 9, he says, For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. See, when people do great things for God, and sometimes it requires a lot of money, a lot of investment, isn't this, isn't this the criticism of, of the world? You sometimes even hear this criticism from Christians. where they are like, oh, why did you spend all this money? It could have just been given to the poor. And what is funny, it's like the scenario, I remember when Answers in Genesis, they built the Creation Museum, people were saying, and, and, and the, the sad thing about Answers in Genesis is that they're preaching a false gospel. But I just want to say the principle here, because a lot of people that have, do have the right gospel and have done great things, they build some huge thing or they build something, and, and sometimes we're just critical, right? And we just look at it and they're saying, well, why did you spend all this money on a building, right? Well, well, think about even this building. You know, maybe when, when, maybe when they invested money building this building, people were critical, saying, well, why did you make this building? Why did you spend all this money? Well, if they didn't, we wouldn't even have this building to rent. So I'm not necessarily against churches spending money building buildings, if they have the money, right? I think the problem with a lot of churches building buildings is that they don't have the money, right? They don't have the money. They don't have the people to support the loan that they're going to take out. Right? And then they just burden their small congregation, you know, trying to buy property, trying to be like the huge mega church when they've only got like 60 or 100 people. And then they have all these problems, right? Because there's not enough money to make it happen. But if there is enough money to make it happen, let's say you had a large congregation and you had the resources, you had the finances to create things like this, hey, it can be a blessing. I mean, it's a blessing to us, right? Because if they didn't do it, we wouldn't be able to rent this place. Um, 
But even so, you know, putting even church buildings aside, just like ministries, like, you know, like I think it's great if, you know, if, if Answers in Genesis wasn't preaching this turn from your sin, salvation, heresy. But just the fact they do do a lot of great stuff in terms of evolution versus creation. And they've made the Creation Museum in America. They made, you know, they built, if you, I don't know if you know about this, they built this life-size ark, which is basically like a zoo that they made to show people how large this ark actually is uh, and just to teach people about the creation story. And, you know, a lot of the criticism they got was, oh, they spent all these millions and millions of dollars building a museum, building an ark. Yeah, but it's great that we have those resources to show people the, the truth of creation. And it, I think they're doing a great work there. Uh, it's just a shame that they don't have the right gospel. But my point is that it's just funny when people criticize when a lot of money is invested to do these great things for God, right? Whether it's building a building, making a museum, making an ark, to teach people the truth of the Bible, and even Christians are saying, oh, why don't you, you know, how many poor people could that have fed? You know, you could have, you could have, you know, you could have not built that and given that money to the poor. And every time I hear that sort of criticism, I think of this story of the alabaster box, and I think, didn't you read your Bible and see that this criticism has already been laid out when somebody gave something valuable to Jesus and Jesus didn't see a problem with it? You know, he didn't see a problem with, you know, this ointment, which was 300 days labor, being just used to anoint his body for the burying. But it's, I think it's just funny how people use that same criticism and yet, you know, this is what this criticism was from the disciples. And we see in John that specifically even Judas was saying that. When Jesus understood it, so you see here again, see Jesus sees what we do, right? And he understands why it's been done. Like some people don't always understand the value and they'll criticize things that you do, like large things you do. Maybe you've invested money in something to do something for God. And people don't always understand the reasoning behind it. But it's interesting that Jesus knows why she's doing this, right? Because this, this Mary of Bethany just comes to him with this alabaster box of ointment, breaks it open, anoints his head, and I think the disciples, none of them really know what's happening, why, why this is happening. But Jesus knows why, right? Because Mary believes what Jesus is preaching, that Jesus is going to die soon, right? Because this is only a week before he goes through that Passion Week, right? And he, and he dies and rises again. So she knows this is, this is near, right? And that Jesus is not going to be with them for very long. But remember, a lot of the disciples still didn't believe at the very end, you know, even at the Last Supper, that Jesus was going to die. He was going to leave them. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. So what do we learn here? We see here that sometimes there is an opportunity to serve God in a capacity where that opportunity is not always there, right? And it might be, you know, just going back to our example, I'm sure there's other examples we can think of, but even if we just think of property, right, there might be that, that opportunity to buy that property at a certain price that doesn't come at another time. And if people are just critical saying, oh, but all this money you spent on that could be used to feed the poor. But even Jesus is saying here, hey, there's an opportunity here for Mary to have done something for Jesus and that opportunity will no longer be there because obviously Jesus is going to die and he's going to rise again. He's not going to be there with them anymore. And it's like that in our life. When we serve God, sometimes we have to look at the opportunity cost because it, the opportunity might not always be there. And sometimes there is a time to dig deep, right? And actually give to the kingdom of God. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. So he's not saying that it's wrong to give to the poor. Obviously, it's good to give to the poor, but the, there's always poor people to give to, right? That's, that's an opportunity. It's always there. So, um, but, but he says, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. So I'm sure Mary of Bethany was very glad she did this. I mean, because she did this, faced this criticism, gave this very valuable substance to the Lord to anoint his body, she was actually eternally honored in the word of God, in John, in Matthew, in Mark, 
where it's saying, hey, wherever this gospel goes, you will know about this woman that broke open this alabaster box and anointed me for my burial. And we do, don't we? Because we all hear about it today and it's in the eternal word of God um, in the gospels here. So you see how this situation was very different to the other one, right? So you see the other one was with the sinner. We didn't know. She was crying. She anointed the feet. She was criticized, you know, because of her past. And then she's assured of salvation, right? Thy sins have been forgiven. Go in peace. Whereas here, the scenario is very different, right? This is Mary of Bethany. We didn't see that in Matthew. We'll see that in a second. But Mary of Bethany, she's anointing Jesus' head with the alabaster box of ointment because she knows Jesus is not going to be with them for very much longer. She's criticized by the disciples saying, hey, why didn't you sell this ointment and give it to the poor? And rather than assurance of her salvation, what is given at the end, what the conclusion of that event is, is that she is honored, right, for all eternity for this thing that she did for the Lord. Now let's quickly go over the other two passages so we can see just the, the, the similarities. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, uh, very precious, and she break the box, so that's probably that wax seal, right? Poured it on his head, and there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of ointment made? So again, that same uh, scenario where they're accusing them of wasting uh, when you give something to God. It's never a waste. For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do, good, do them good. But me ye have not always. So again, he's saying, hey, you always have poor people to give to, but there are certain opportunities that come by once in a lifetime, and we need to sometimes take those opportunities to do something great for God. She had done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. Now, why did Mary know that Jesus was going to go soon? Why did Mary believe that Jesus was, was going to die? You know, maybe it's because Mary, we see in Luke, she took the time to listen to Jesus, right? To listen to his word. Look here in Luke. See, because why often are we ignorant about the Bible? Why often are we ignorant about the truths of the Bible? Because we don't take the time to study the Bible. We don't take the time to listen to the preaching of God's word. We don't read it enough and, and look at it so we, we just assume things, right? We just assume, we, or we don't know things. We're ignorant of the truth. Now, Mary was not ignorant of the truth. Why? Now, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. So this is Mary's sister. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So you see how when you're sitting at somebody's feet, it's not necessarily meaning that you're right where the feet are. You're just sitting close by, right? I mean, you can imagine a lot of people sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him preach. Um, so the, 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 I guess the, the euphemism is that you're just near, nearby, right? Not that you're right where the feet are. And heard his word. But Martha, so we see here the difference between Mary and Martha, but Martha was cumbered about much serving, right? A lot of activity, but not taking the time to actually listen to what Jesus has to say. And came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. So you see how you know, some, she throws this, this wild accusation over at Jesus because she's frustrated with her sister. And she throws the accusation at Jesus that Jesus doesn't care about Martha. Of course Jesus cares about Martha, right? But sometimes when we're stressed, we're not thinking straight, we accuse or you know, we go through some hard times, we accuse God of things that are, are, are absolutely foolish. Now Jesus turns it on her, right? Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. So he doesn't give her a hard time, right? Because he knows we are but flesh. So she's really busy doing this. He says to about Mary, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. See, so there is a time to sit and listen, right? There's a time to be active. There's a time to be doing a lot of work. But there's also a time to sit 
and listen and hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And church is one of those times where we ought to come together, we ought to have our heart prepared to hear what God has to say to us. Not the frame of mind where we come to church, we're just going through the motions, but our heart is not really there. Our mind's not really there. It's like when we sing the songs. Are you singing them unto the Lord or are you just wording them but your mind's somewhere else? You know, no, the time, there's a time to sing to God when we come to church and we're praising God in hymns. It's like the time of preaching. There's a time where we try and steal our children. I know it's not always easy, but we try and steal our children. We try and get our children to focus. It's like when I see my kids sometimes unfocused when the Bible reading is on. I don't just let them, I try and encourage them like, hey, Look at the words, listen to the Bible, listen to the Bible reading, just to encourage them to do the right thing. I know children are going to be children, but let's at least try and encourage them to, to, to be closer to where we are. Another thing I think of when I think of, you know, there's a time to listen to the preaching is, you know, when the, the, when the preaching is going on, you know, that shouldn't be the time to go to the toilet. You know, I know maybe you've forgotten to go to the toilet before the preaching starts and you need to go. I'm not saying you can't go use the toilet, but I'm saying it's a matter of the heart, right? If, if listening to God's word is important to you, you're not just going to wait until the preaching starts and then go and use the toilet or get, let your kids go and use the toilet. It, it's obvious with kids and people that aren't spiritual that they're just trying to get out of something they don't want to do. So... You know, with my family, like you see me take them to the toilet before because I don't want them to have that excuse to go and miss something that they might absorb just because they need to go use the toilet. And it's the same for us as well. I think in Mexico as well, the, the, the preachers used to always joke. It's like when they start preaching, like the people are just going in and out because, you know, it's just they always have to use the toilet when the preaching is on. And there's just like more people walking up and down the aisle during church than before church, you know, because they're all coming and going to, to go use the toilet. So there is a time to listen, right? Let the word of God speak to you and there's a time to, 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 uh, to do the work, right? But we need a, a balance of both. So why did Mary know these things? Well, it's probably because Mary took the time to listen. She took the time to learn of Jesus. And it's interesting that even six days before the Passover, you know, when Jesus was going to be you know, sacri uh, sacrificed for our sins and he's going to give his life for us, she is anointing his body with precious ointment, right? It's like she didn't just bring some cheap oil just to anoint the body. She didn't think, well, you know, Jesus is going to die anyway. What's the difference? You know, why use an expensive oil? No, because when you do something for Jesus, she wanted to give her best. You know, who knows what other ointments she had in the house? She probably took the most costly one because she knew she was doing something for Jesus, giving her best, anointing his body for the burial. And look, the other disciples had no idea why she was even doing it, right? Because they were ignorant of what was about to happen. Let's look in John now. So this is the last passage where we see Mary uh, um, here. Uh, I don't know, did I, I missed something further on. I thought I had it in my notes. I must have had it later on. I must have changed it in here, but not in, in this one. All right, so this is John 12, 1. This is the last passage where we see Mary uh, anointing Jesus. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Um, there they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So you see Lazarus, and this is quite amazing because in John 11, Lazarus was dead and he was risen again. And now he's eating with Jesus at, at this, this thing. And a lot of people come to, to see Lazarus because they're, they're surprised, obviously, that Lazarus has been risen from the dead. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. So I've just underlined that because we can see here now how much ointment there was. There was one pound of ointment of spikenard. So I guess you could work out how much it costs, you know, 300, 300 uh, pennies per pound. Uh, it's a crazy expensive uh, uh, substance. Very costly. Anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Now, what I take from that is, I know obviously in, in physical terms, she's broken open this alabaster box and now everyone in the house is smelling this perfume. But one spiritual lesson we can take from this is, you know, when we do something great for God, yes, you might come across criticism. You might say, oh, you know, why are, why are you doing all this? You could have given all this money for the poor. But when eventually this thing is done, it's like people can't ignore it, right? It's like throughout the house, people can smell the effects 
of that great work. And, and this is what's great about people willing to get out of the boat, right? And do these great things. Is they, they do have a great impact on the world uh, and, and what they do for the kingdom of God. And it's like here, when you do something great for God, it can't help but spread and have influence and have an effect on, on, on this, this world. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So Judas, the one that betrayed Jesus, was one of the disciples that had indignation in himself. But look here, we see some insight into the heart of Judas. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear what was put therein, right? So he was carrying the money that was given to Jesus and he was stealing from Jesus and he's criticizing, not because he cares about poor people, he's just criticizing because he's a thief. Now, think about that when you're criticized, right? When you're criticized for doing something great, it's generally not because they, they honestly care about, you know, what, what is being done. Oftentimes, they're just criticizing just to be critical and they have other reasons. They just have a bad heart about why they are critical. And we ought not to have this heart, right? We ought to, if we are going to be critical, that we have constructive criticism. Right? You know, the difference between constructive criticism and just being critical is, you know, critical is you just, you just can point out the problem. Right? That's easy. Anybody can just point out problems. You know, they call it the, that person Captain Obvious, right? Just point out the problems, Captain Critical. But constructive criticism is when you can point out the problem, but then you have some solutions to offer. How can you actually fix that problem? And if you have that mindset it's your, in your workplace, you'll be a much more valuable employee as well is not only can you identify the problems, but you identify the fixes as well. You have some solutions that are better than what is currently put in place, and you actually add some value to the company. So this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put there. And then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. So I just had this passage here, just thinking about you know, that odour of the ointment spreading and and how we ought to be, like the odour of us, right? In the sense, not, not our physical odour, but our, our light shining in the world and having that influence. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is head on, set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we see the effect of our good works to um, God. So I'll end it there, but just, just end on this thought, right? Uh, so what's the application, the conclusion is, is, you know, what is your alabaster box, you know, and are you willing to give it to Jesus? Because what does the alabaster box represent? In my mind, obviously, stories, we can, we can sort of apply them in different ways. But one application I want you guys to think of is, what is your alabaster box? In the sense that, what is an alabaster box in my mind? It's something that is not really a necessity, right? Because it's not like this, it's not like Mary really needed precious ointment to smell nice. I mean, it's something of value, but it's not something of necessity. It's something that she can give up in order to further the kingdom of God. So what do I think the al alabaster box of ointment represents? It's something of value that is not a necessity that we can give up for the service of Christ. Now, what is different, I guess, alabaster boxes that people have? One might be, you know, you give up a job to serve God full time. I know a lot of ministers, a lot of preachers, that's what they do, right? They, they may give up a successful career and something that is a lot more lucrative, but they decide to work for a church. They decide to do something that doesn't pay as much. It just provides their needs, but then they get to serve God and that's how they've given this alabaster box to God. It might be a mum, right, who leaves a career to raise children. You know, you have this, you might be a very talented person, very valuable in the workplace, but you decide, you know what, I'm going to give that up, I'm going to give this alabaster box to Jesus and raise my children to serve the Lord and focus on that. What are some other examples I've got here? Another example might be a business owner or somebody who has a career, right, who gives it up to take a stand. Right now with the same-sex marriage debate going on and you know, now we've, you know, we've got same-sex marriage and whatnot, you know, are you willing to take a stand? 
You know, you might have to take a stand at work. You might have to tell people what you believe. Or as a business, you may need to refuse some business. That is like an alabaster box, something that is valuable, that you may not, you could do without, but you give it up for the kingdom of God, right? And the last one I've got here is just, you know, what about the different pleasures that we have in life? We live in a very privileged society here where we have all the gadgets we want, we can take holidays, we can go and have fun, and all that costs money, doesn't it? All that costs money. All that money could be used for something else. And I'm not, I'm not saying here that there isn't a time and place for you know, refresh and relaxation. I'm not saying it's necessarily sinful to do those things. And it's like with Mary, it wasn't sinful for her to have this alabaster box of precious ointment. Right? She had it. She could have used it when she went out at night or whatever and she, she made herself smell nice or maybe she was saving it for a gift. Maybe she had it as an investment and she was going to sell it one day and use that money to pay rent or whatnot. But she was willing to give that up, right? She was willing to give up this thing that was not necessary. And it might be, in our mind, it might be a holiday. It might be, you know, maybe you upgrade your phone every year. And I, I, I still don't know why people do that. Like, it's, your last year's phone was fine, right? It worked fine. You know, like, you know, you see me with an iPhone 6, but then I, I upgraded from a 3GS like five years ago. It was like all broken and not working anymore. So I plan on keeping this phone for a couple of years because I hope it, it lasts me that long. So I don't, I think people that just upgrade their gadgets year and year, it's just like, do you really have that much money to spend? You know, they're just spending, because these phones, like, they cost a lot of money, right? And this money that you're putting in. What else could that money be used for? Is this an alabaster box? that could be given to Jesus, right? And used for something greater than just, you know, a holiday or a new gadget, right? To serve God. So we see here, you know, when you give to God, it's always going to be noticed. Jesus notices even though man doesn't. And you're going to face criticism. You know, even if you, if you try and give a lot to God, people are going to criticize you, saying, why are you wasting your money? Or why, why are you doing that? Why are you giving all this money to God? People are going to criticize you for that. But hopefully what it ends up going towards has an effect like the order in the house. And what else can we learn from this? That sometimes there's an opportunity to do something for God that only comes every now and then. And if there's an opportunity to do something, it's like with that, that no thing. Like the, it was great that the Anglican church did kind of dig deep. And, and they were criticized for it too, to, to donate to the no campaign. Because there's a, there was a time and place that this battle was going on. And it's like, how much did we give? to that cause and now it's here but what did we do so that's what i want you guys to think about that's my ending thought you know what's your alabaster box do you have an alabaster box of precious ointment and are you willing to give it up to further the kingdom of god let's pray thank you lord for uh this this story and for this example of these women that were willing to give up something precious uh, to give it to you and we pray, Lord, that we would have a heart to give to you, Lord, to give to your kingdom so that, Lord, the impact of the gospel and the impact of churches can, can go far and wide. And we pray, Lord, that, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be this church, but if we see areas where there is a need for financial assistance, that, Lord, we are willing to give over um, of our finances and our time to, to, to help further your kingdom. So I pray, Lord, that you'd help us not to be materialistic, Help us, Lord, to hold onto our things with loose hands and pray, Lord, that when the time comes, when there's an opportunity to do something great, that, Lord, we would be willing to let go and, and further that work. We pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.